the reading corner today, I'm joined by world building wizard, mother of dragons and preserver of mythological creatures, Cornelia Funke. We're going to be swimming into the depths of her third novel in the Dragon Rider series, The Aurelia Curse. So first of all, I'm giving you a very warm welcome and you're speaking to me from Volterra in Italy. I do, Nikki, I do. I changed the world again, not very actively. I just moved from one to the other. Yes. (laughs) The obvious question to ask you is about the length of time between each of your Dragon Rider books. I know you're a very, very busy writer and creator, so it's not that you've been twiddling your thumbs doing nothing. But there's a big gap between each of these books. Tell us a little bit about why. Is it just that you were too busy or the right story wasn't presenting itself? Exactly that. For me, it's one of my greatest fears to write a sequel that disappoints the reader. Mm -hmm. And I always think that then hurts the first book as well, Mm -hmm. because you will never feel the same about it again. So Dragon Rider, the first book, I in every reading, I had a little boy or little girl standing up and saying, Cornelia, when is there a sequel of Dragon Rider? So I, believe me, I tried. And each time I started to write, I felt this is not yet Mm. a fully strong story that holds up against the first. So I always dropped it. Mm-hmm. And then at some point, I worked in Los Angeles with a group of artists on a possible digital rendering of Dragon Rider, something we were dreaming of that kids take it and they can chase dragons and whatever. It failed hopelessly. We, we couldn't make the technology work. But while we were doing that, I got so much into that world again. And um, the Griffin's Feather came very naturally. And I felt like it's equal to the first book. and. I actually wanted to write another one quite right afterwards, but I have two other series going. So the, the next Dragon Rider took its time and a fire was chasing me away from my home when I was working on the third. So the Aurelia has its roots in the winter of 2018 and it was deeply set in Malibu where mm. I was living and a love song to their place. I did not know at that time I would ever leave it. Mm. So is this the forest fires? They were devastating. I had to run from the most monstrous fire I've ever seen. Um, It was very scary and very frightening. Uh, I was evacuated for three months. I came back to a farm that had been saved by four gardeners. And so you will meet Alfonso Fuentes in uh, this book, who is the savior of my farm. Oh, how amazing. It was unforgettable what they did for me. So um, I was evacuated and and Alfonso called and fires were behind him. And he said, Senora, I'm so sorry. We have to give up. I saw my melted trash cans, just melted plastic on the floor. I saw my head just burning. And I thought all my memories, all my art, all my notebooks. And then two hours later, Alfonso called and said, we went back. We had to. He saved the houses. He saved my donkeys. He saved my and a ducks. How can you say thank you for that? You will never be able to. Mm-hmm. I dedicated two books to him by now. And, and I made him a character in this one because it was such an enchantment to see what people can do for you. I mean, that's just such a stunning story. And I hope that the land will recover. Yes. It did. It bloomed afterwards. It was the most incredible thing that happened afterwards. And it was very hard for me to go now. Yeah. But, yeah. So yeah. we're going to talk about <laughs> the Aurelia curse. The big quest in this story is to preserve a giant jellyfish. There's a strong ecological theme throughout the book, as indeed there is through the whole series. But this time it's the preservation of the ocean that takes centre stage. So can you tell us something about the different strands and ideas that started to come together for you in this story? They were, of course, very much evoked by by the place. You know, as I was writing that in Malibu, and I rarely write about a place I live in, but this was such an overwhelming place for me, as you can imagine, in northern Germany, Mm. we'd never seen grey whales come out of the sea or cormorants fishing, and to just sit on the beach and have that, and um, it's needed to go into a story, especially about the preservation of the wild. 
the Aurelia then became this character of the ocean I was looking at every day. Mm-hmm. And I'm very careful with messages, you know, in, in, in a book. I do believe that my readers, in a way, are companions traveling with me. I don't feel like they are people I need to teach. Mm-hmm. But what I try is to ask questions we all ask and then tell them what answers I found. And uh, I learned so much disturbing and wondrous things about nature that in this book, it all went in there. But of course, also my worries that we all feel at the moment. I think you agree, we both probably didn't believe we would see climate change the way Mm -hmm. we see it in our lifetime. And I felt in California at some point, I live in the shop window of climate change. From mismanagement of the forest, misunderstandings, a lack of listening to the indigenous people who who dealt with it in a far better way. Used to do controlled burns and they understood the land. We don't. And and there is this feeling for we have these miracles right in front of our door. And if there is a a way, I'm working at the moment with a with a farmer and a herbologist on a book that where plants are some of the main characters to just show my enchantment with the natural world. Mm -hmm. And I believe in the little steps, yeah. you know, because once we think about the big steps, we mostly fail. Yeah. Enchantment's a good word. And enchantment is coming back to the Aurelia curse in, in which enchantment features very strongly. We're very serious here because these are serious things. But it's interesting how fantasy writing can sometimes get us closer to yes. those ideas. Absolutely. For me, fantasy is far closer to reality. As our ancestors knew, as they were talking myth and fairy tale. But now as we lose our contact to nature, I think we have lost our ability to understand the world through images and what fantasy does, clads it in costumes and makes it more clear. I think it's also, it's a Tolkien quote that says, who is against escape but the prison ward? Uh I always thought it's so insightful because why shouldn't we escape to then come back stronger? Why shouldn't we escape that so-called reality that people try to build in our heads and say, wait a moment, Mm -hmm. this is not how the world has to be. Let's step back in Mm -hmm. science fiction, in fantasy. Let's question what you tell us as reality. It is a literature of ideas, really, isn't it? You look at writers like Ursula Le Guin, for instance. You know, how profound is that but writing? So prof- I remember when I read um, her books, you know, when I was 16, 17, that changed my view of the world. I was a great Star Trek fan also, because just this, who is human? What does it mean to be human? All these questions can brilliantly be asked in, in fantasy and science fiction. Yeah. I want to just talk briefly about folklore really and whether there's any specific cultural folklore that you find particularly appealing but the more I learn about the different folklores of other countries I I find more and more very intriguing ones Uh, one of the mythologies that impressed me most actually is the creation myth of the Maori in New Zealand and when I was in New Zealand I, I have it by now as a habit when I go to a new country I read first of all a fairy tale or myth to understand where that country comes from and uh, they have this beautiful myth that that father and mother of creation were making love to each other and they were choking their children between them so their children got very upset and tried to separate mother and father and finally managed to push the father into the sky and the mother on the ground and The father cried so much that the rain was born. And the mother cried so much that the children couldn't bear it. And they flipped her on her face. And she cried into the grass and the dew was born. That's beautiful. It was so powerful and beautiful. So I can only highly recommend, if you love to read mythology, the Maori Mm -hmm. myth is, is, is so powerful and unforgettable. Uh, quite something. Anyway, that your creatures are strongly connected to their environment. Trolls fit in with the craggy landscapes of Sweden and Norway, selkies, the rocky coastlines of Scotland. But in this story, you're going to find themselves, they can find themselves far from home. A leprechaun might find itself in California. So this is where I was going to ask you about your own itinerant lifestyle. 
um, perhaps we can say a little bit more about the ways in which your living in different places has informed your writing. Is it is it central to you as a writer, this moving around? People don't believe when I say that here to my young artists, that until the age of, I would say, 40, 45, I did not move. I was sitting on my sofa. I was sitting at my desk. I was in Hamburg. I was writing. I found it already stressful to go to Frankfurt. I was not a traveler at all. Didn't enjoy traveling. And then, of course, my work forced me, in a way, to meet readers, to meet publishers. And I still remember I always took my whole family because I hate it the feeling to be separated, to, to leave a place behind. So how much that changes you to suddenly be exposed to other cultures, to other horizons, another language, because I'm more and more, English became more and more dominant in my, in my life. When people say, oh, people don't change. I changed so vastly through places. And I, I, I've learned that the Native American uh, tribes do believe that place defines you. And that place makes you, in a way. And I think we've forgotten about that sometimes. Mm. How much that shapes our soul and our being. And I think the fabulous creatures are a good proof for that. Because a troll was, of course, born from a Scandinavian landscape, right? And yes, there are parallels. But it's unique because the landscape is unique. And, and that is, for me, such an interesting revelation there's a saying, you probably have the same thing in German, but in English, there's no place like home. Yes. What does home mean to you now? Is it the place you're living or do you have a spiritual home? I wonder that uh, last night, you know, I, we talked a lot about it here because now all the artists who were supposed to come to California and then because of COVID now are suddenly in Tuscany. It's different from what I expected in many ways. I always thought if I go back to Europe, I'm going to do two legs. One stands in England, one stands in Italy. You know, because I, all my characters always move to Italy in my books. All my Italian friends also said, your first name is Italian, Cornelia. And I learned Italian when I was 25, so I can speak it. So it's all coming together. And I believe there's a web in life that we follow. I believe we have an interior map, almost, that yeah. tells us where to pick up pieces of our life. And if we don't go to those places that call, we will not pick up that piece of our life. I do believe in that. So I thought I'm called to Cornwall as well and to England, as I always found very strongly connected to Salisbury mm -hmm. and to Scotland. But now with Brexit, it seems the call is not so easily answered. I haven't fully given up yet. It can happen in some way. I just believe it has to. It's interesting you're talking to me from Volterra in Italy. Uh, because although I've never lived in Italy, you know, you can visit some places and you feel connected quite quickly. Yes. Canada is one place and Italy is another, some parts of Italy. It's very strange, yes. isn't it? Right. As if suddenly we have that resonance in our in, inside and other places don't resonate at all. I remember when I came to San Francisco for the first time, I thought I would love it, but I didn't. The resonance did not come. And then you come to places where you don't expect it. And suddenly you hear, the, you hear it almost like a sound. And I always had it very strong in England. I, I don't know why. I have no roots I, I can claim or anything. I had a strange affection for the English language. Since I'm 16, I only read in English. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I think we don't have to know. But we can follow those echoes and, and live them from time to time. So we're talking about language here. And I couldn't find the translator credit in the Aurelia curse. So did you write the book called Translate It Yourself? No, I wrote it in English. You wrote it in English. So you're so, translating into German then. <laughs> so when Barry Cunningham came to me, and we all know how fabulous the publisher Barry is, um, he said to me, Kunia, could you imagine to get the Dragon Rider book ready for my, my, uh, my anniversary, for my publishing anniversary? Then, of course, COVID happened and everything, but I still laughed and found it... You know, I was very honored by his request. And I, and I said, Barry, I don't see how that can work unless I write it in English and we don't have the additional time of the translation. And so, as you may know, I wrote um, The Pan's Labyrinth in English because I had to collaborate with Guillermo. And I felt really confident I can do this now. Mm -hmm. And I've lived in the English language now so long. 
I remember I felt hopelessly 10 years ago with ghost night. Oh my God, it was a disaster. So, so suddenly I could do it. And, and so it was such a joy actually to write in English. I so loved it because the English has a kind of light footedness. Even when you write about serious things, German gets very heavy. Rainy? No. And here's a dog with an English name. Um, it was such a joy that I felt, my God, these books are almost born to be written in English. And then the translator came in, who had also translated Pan's Labyrinth. And I and Imke, my editor, worked another six weeks on the German translation while also working on the English Polish. It was an absolute nightmare. It felt like rowing a little boat over the ocean. Uh, we worked on the book in three versions and up and down. But, but still, I think it was nevertheless a good thing. I was going to ask you about translation of names in particular. Of course, the names were in German originally because Dragon Rider was written in German originally. Yes. So in translating names, I mean, I love, for instance, sorrel is one of my favourite herbs. There's, and it's yes. such a... And yes, idea. It's so beautiful. But in German, is it the same? Not no. at all. So uh, sorrel in German would be called, if you would translate it, sulfur fur. Uh-huh. So Anthea called me and said, I'm so sorry, Cornelia, but sulfur really sounds terrible in English. We have to find another name for, for her. And also, what do we call her? A cobalt? A cobalt is not really right in English because she is hairy. So Anthea said, I suggest there's a certain kind of brownie in Scotland, very hairy. And I think we should call her sorrel. as She's so sharp and spicy. And I think that is what shows a genius translator. Yeah. You know, there is a name that's totally different. The yeah. same was with Fire Drake. He's called Long in German. But if you spell that in English, it's Lang. Mm. And it's a Chinese word for dragon. But that did not work at all. So she came up with Fire Drake, which I think is glorious. And all these decisions, a twig leg is another one because he in, in, in German is fly leg. But fly leg does not sound good in English. Twiggly. Sounds fantastic. It's it's genius, isn't it? And we have to remember the work of translators and creating of translators yeah. very big into the books because you know when I read Inkart in English, it's Anthea's voice and how she clad that book into perfect English words. And I have such admiration for that mm-hmm. craft. And when a translation doesn't work, and I've had cases like that where readers mm-hmm. called me and said, it doesn't sound like you. And I looked at the translation, I was like, oh, <laughs> you need to twist here. You need to twist that just to make it sound. I think the thing to uh, really emphasize is that it's not just about meaning, but it's about, you've talked about sound. It's the auditory quality of the language. Yes. And I always read aloud while I'm writing to just taste the language. And we all work very hard on everything because there are Germanisms from time to time. There are habits I have so from my native tongue. But by now, I think, I feel, especially as I'm now trying to cope with Italian here, and it's a disaster, I yearn to speak English because mm-hmm. there I know how to express myself. And the, you know, how you can weave sentences together in English is, is so much more um, song-like. German can, as you know, be a very rough and language that isolates the sounds and I heard from German children that they said reading me made them write in a different way because I try to make the German sound beautiful for me the sound is very important and you can manage but it's harder interesting so just moving on a little bit because although there was this, these big gaps between your Dragon Rider books Dragon Rider was recently made into a film with CGI I don't know how many films now, many films, well, your I books, think. 12. How well do they translate into films? Some better than others. Some better than others. And But, you know, I, had, I was full of hubris when I sold the rights for Dragon Raider because I thought I know everything that can happen to my material. I thought I've been through lots and lots of problems with, with film adaptations that I know. And I thought, well, take the money and run because you will build an artist program from that. And I did. I took the rights money and, and built my artist in residence program. But 
what I was not expecting, and that is the first time this ever happened in a in a production, where they just crippled my my characters, and that I find unforgivable. Mm. Because Ben, the, the orphan boy who is my hero, I wanted to show that a boy, although he has such hardship in his life, can have an innocent heart. Because I have met children like that. They will not always be crippled or mean or see. And here comes the director and says, no, the boy is a thief and he only likes, be, is excited about the dragon because he will lead him to gold. That is such a betrayal of my character, who I still following, that I went to war on it. And they took some quotes and out, like the one, oh, I can find gold with this dragon. But the boy is still not at all the hero I meant to talk about. And I said to them at some point, film will always change plot. It has to. But my characters are sacred. You cannot change them and you cannot change my values. I, for example, believe in friendship. I believe in collaboration. You don't see any of this. Mm -hmm. There were stupid cliches, like the dragon cannot spit fire. I beg you. I, I said to them, this is one of the oldest and most cliche ideas. Well, no, this is original. No, it's not. So yeah, it was a very painful experience. I fought in vain about many things. So all I did is I was completely silent about mm -hmm. it. And I said to everybody, it's not my book. Mm -hmm. And I had them take my name off and just say based on elements of that was all I could do. And um, yeah, it was very sad. At least I have my artist program. I do want to tell our listeners about your artists program because it just sounds such an important work that you're doing here. But I, I think by now, you know, when you are in your 60s now, I think you you ask yourself, so, OK, you can write a few more books, which I hope I will. But there's also the task to maybe share what you learned about the book business, about art, about storytelling and the importance of it, because that's so easily forgotten in our very commercial times. And it's been so fulfilling. It, I, I started it um, in 2019 after the fire. And I had a year of 26 artists visiting me and working with me from uh, Germany, from England, from Mexico, Argentina. I have collaborations with the Colombian Festival, with um, Indian schools. I have now, uh, I will have two young writers from Salisbury coming. I want to team up with a Main Street Trading Company in Scotland and do something with them because yeah. I love the bookstore so much. You know, I, I want to also find people who may not be creatives main time and come and visit and meet. And I have four little quarters here, four little apartments for artists and I have workshops and I invite musicians, illustrators, and writers who are on the verge of breaking, you know, of um, making it a full-time job or are doing it as a second job um, between 20 and 38, but in between also inviting experienced artists mm. who then give advice. So it goes very really organically. Lots of serendipity involved. I don't want to have too much competition. But I hope I can continue this until I drop dead because, my God, it's so beautiful. So Please. what do they do? Is it just giving them the time and the space and a dialogue? It's just that. You know, I, I, or I say I pay your travels. You will have lodgings. You will have two or three other young artists as company. And, of course, me. I'm available whenever you want to talk and show me something. There are no obligations. I will not ask for you to finish anything or show anything. I give you space. I give you time. And it works so easily and brilliantly. And people have asked me, well, what if somebody comes, you know, who doesn't fit? Well, I always invite people first just a week, you know, and mm -hmm. then to see, do they fit into the tribe? So far, your experience may be the same in children's book and illustration. And also, with, there are so many wonderful people. Mm -hmm. there's, it, it, there's so much playfulness. Mm -hmm. And they're all such different temperaments. When I look at the three girls I have here at the moment, each one's so utterly different from the other. They're obviously getting a lot from the experience and from you as well. You must also be feeling that you are learning from them. Oh, in, incredibly. 
and you know, I had a um, Aisha Hamiat, who is a wonderful, wonderful Muslim illuminator from, uh, from actually from um, from Windsor. Very British and uh, origins in Indonesia and South Africa at the same time. Aisha is just a miracle, and she taught kids from downtown LA the symmetry, you know, that she had learned at the Prince's School. It was it was amazing, and. Um, for example, I have a young Italian artist here on Saturday who will teach us how to make dyes from plants because I want to plant a garden where they can make their own colors. So for me, it's also very much about craftsmanship because I have the greatest respect for crafts. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we start. I would like to have people who make baskets and, you know, I, I want to put that all together. And I want to have musicians who suddenly team up with illustrators and writers with illustrators. And I, I love to see how that already happens between the girls. And we have, you know, a WhatsApp group where we all during COVID posted our art. So. It's, it's amazing, Cornelia. You are an alchemist. <laughs> I, I, I only have to throw it together. That's all I have to do. <laughs> So, you know, I very much hope I will be able to do that in England as well, because I would love to have that second branch there. Yeah. Can I just say that uh, what we've got today, uh, we started out thinking about Dragon Rider, the Aurelia curse, which is just about to be published. What we've got today is a real sense of the creator behind this book and how the things that are important to you really, as they always will, they sort of emerge through your writing and your work. But in a very light way, where story leads, always story leads the way. Um, and it's been an honour and a privilege and a delight talking to you today. I can only say the same, Nikki. Thank you for giving me such pleasure. In the Reading Corner is presented by Nikki Gamble and produced by Alison Hughes. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please do leave a review for us. To find out about other projects, including an audience with events and the Exploring Children's Literature Summer School, visit www.exploringchildrensliterature.uk. Join us again soon in the Reading Corner on your favourite podcast platform.